Good morning. Hope everyone's doing well this morning. Welcome to the Huntington Presbyterian Church. We extend a special greeting this morning to our visitors. Please sign the guest register in the back of the sanctuary and fill out a visitor's card located in the pew rack. Please place that in the offering plate. We're also happy to welcome those who are listening on the radio or internet. Huntington Presbyterian Church is located at 508 Mifflin Street in Huntington, Pennsylvania. Our Sunday worship begins at 10.30 a.m. and is preceded by adult Sunday school at 9 a.m. The Reverend Brett D. Hoover is our pastor. We look forward to welcoming you in person sometime soon. Are there any announcements this morning from the congregation? Seeing none, uh, Pastor Brett has a couple of things to tell us about this morning. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'll give you about 40% on that. <laughs> well, I, I just want to do a, give another announcement that uh, uh, immediately following the worship service, we will have a brief, and I will highlight brief, congregational meeting. And the purpose of the meeting is to uh, elect new officers. So uh, if you are a member of the church, please stick around for that meeting so that uh, we can have a quorum and we don't have to do the same thing again next week. That's your incentive. We will do this for as long as it takes. Um, and uh, one more announcement, and that this is also contained in your bulletin. Uh, there's uh, going to be a member, uh, a new member orientation class that uh, will will take place December uh, December 10th. And the sign up sheet for that is is uh, right in the back of the sanctuary to the right of the of the doors, the central doors. There's also a sign up sheet on the bulletin board uh, uh, right beside the office. So if you are uh, interesting, if you are interested in joining the church, or if you are um, just interested in hey doing something fun on a on a Sunday. Uh, like talk, again, talking about Presbyterian history and theology and uh, and all that fun stuff. It'll be a good time. M- Melissa will bake brownies. She's the baker. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, so please, uh, uh, please sign up for that. If you, again, if you're interested in joining the church. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship with our prelude.
please stand and join me for the call to worship. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. seated and join me in the prayer of confession followed by a time of silent confession. Righteous God, you have crowned Jesus Christ as Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him and are slow to acknowledge his rule. We give allegiance to the powers of this world and fail to be governed by justice and love. In your mercy, forgive us. Raise us to acclaim him as ruler of all, that we may be loyal ambassadors, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear these comforting words. If you repent and believe in God's redeeming mercy, your sins are forgiven. Trust in God's promise and begin anew your life with God and all people in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
are forgiven in Jesus Christ, and as people who are forgiven, we are called to forgive each other. As we pass the peace of Christ with one another this morning, let us, extend, let us extend God's forgiveness and truly be at peace as a community of faith. And now may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Pass Christ's peace. Oh, look at that. What? Do you know who's do you know who's on that list? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Hey guys, how are you doing today? Good? Oh yeah, that's great. Well I, I have something well right here. Maybe you can help me out. What is this? A cord? What kind of cord? An extension cord. Yeah, that looks about right. Yeah, that looks about right. How many prongs do you see there? Three. Yep, three three prong extension cord. What color are extension cords normally? What's that? Orange. Orange. Yes, I've seen orange. Uh, gray. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. That, this is kind. Of, what would you? What color would you call this? Light brown. Light brown. Tan. Yeah, I like. I like that. <laughs> it, I mean, yes. It's. A, I mean, we could debate this forever. I think tan. I'm going to go with tan. I'm going to go with tan. Uh, well, what do we use extension cords for? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So um, uh, we we uh, we need to plug into uh, an outlet. Now, now this isn't. I don't think this goes very far, right? That's about five, six feet, maybe. Maybe we'll say we'll say maybe. Well, yeah. So we we plug it into an outlet, right? And then we can we can have power, right? We can plug it into something like a lamp. Right, and that that way we, our lamp can light up. Yeah. Uh, I use you use that? Yeah, yeah. I use them at the at my house too, especially when when you hang up Christmas lights. My mom, my, my mom uses that for Christmas things. Yeah. They can light up. Well, it, it, we're gonna read a, we're gonna read a story here about uh, that Jesus tells about uh, sheep and goats, and uh, this really neat thing that uh, Jesus says that there are some people who are really plugged into God. Uh, and he calls those people sheep. They're, they're plugged into God and they share his light and his power and his love with other people. And especially the people who, who are most in need of it, the most, uh, uh, the, the, the least fortunate people around us. And he calls those people sheep. But, uh, in the Bible, he, he teaches, uh, God teaches us how to be plugged in to God. How, how it is we become his sheep. He teaches his disciples. Jesus teaches his disciples how to be loving and kind. And when we see those lessons, we figure out how we can plug into God and how we can be loving and kind to other people. And when we do that, we, we become God's extension cord in the world. We, we share his light, we share his power, and we share his love with the people around us. Yeah. I have something to tell you. Oh, you do? Yeah. That's right. You shouldn't waste light. No. That's right. All the power will go out. Can we share a prayer together? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, help us to stay plugged into you so that we can share your light and love with the people around us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, now it's the last Sunday of the month, which means you guys get to help out and push the, push the cart around and collect our, our stuff for the food bank. Are you, are you ready to do that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, have fun.
Would you all please uh, bow with me in prayer as we prepare our hearts to receive God's holy word. Let's pray. <laughs> o God most high, everlasting Lord, mighty and lifted up, grant to us your Holy Spirit that in these words of Holy Scripture our hearts may be lifted up and our minds set on heavenly realities and that contemplating the reign of our ascended Lord, we might long to be with him and enter into the glory of his eternal kingdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all his angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king replied, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. So this is one of those passages that I I would say can generate a wide variety of responses. Maybe that's the politically correct way of saying it. It will generate a wide variety of responses. And I'm sure all of us here, or many of us here, have heard these words before. And for some of us, we we hear this as a resonating call for justice, a call to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned, and welcome the stranger. And for others of us, it might make us a little bit nervous, a little bit nervous, Maybe we know there are things on this list, things described in this passage that we feel we're not doing. Or maybe we're wondering, are we doing it enough? But we should really start by being shocked at what Jesus says here. Because he's saying something that would have utterly bewildered his ancient listeners, and I think even bewilders us still today. Jesus is saying that God identifies with the lowly. God is most closely connected with and concerned about the people who have nothing in life. And I would submit to you that this is a uniquely Christian understanding of the character and nature of God. Every other religion, especially religions in the ancient world, tend to associate God or the gods with those who were sort of on the top of the social ladder. Those who had all the wealth and power, success and influence, those were the people who were with God. And sometimes that was understood quite literally, that kings claimed to in fact be gods. 
And that was certainly the case with the, the pharaohs in Egypt. That's probably the most, uh, the most known thing. Pharaohs believed themselves to be gods, the sons of gods. And, of course, uh, some other kings in the ancient Near East had the same perception. But still, no matter where you were in the ancient world, if you were powerful, if you were successful, if you were on top in life, it was understood it was because the gods were with you. The gods were right next to you and beside you. But then Jesus comes along. And he kind of even radicalizes an idea that you see in the Jewish prophetic tradition. And he says that God isn't just specially concerned for the powerful. He's actually more concerned about the weak. The least of these. The poorest people. In fact, he's so closely identified with the lowest that if you give service to them, you're actually serving God himself. And by extension, if you don't have a concern for the weakest, if you don't care about the most forgotten people around you, then you don't have any connection with God. Now, I warned you all three weeks ago that Matthew 25 was a hard chapter of Scripture to hear. It gave us hard and challenging messages, and certainly this one is no different. But it's important to point out what this passage isn't saying, what it's not saying. The entry into God's kingdom isn't a reward. That's not what's going on here. The entry into God's kingdom is an inheritance. That's exactly how Jesus describes it in verse 34. The kingdom that they're entering into, the eternal kingdom, it's not something that they're earning. It's something that's given. Because really, that's how an inheritance works. It's something you receive through a relationship not necessarily something that you earn. I'm given a a, a proclivity to a certain sin. I I, I like to watch irreverent cartoon shows uh, and some that are are really, really, really irreverent. And uh, one one in particular I won't uh, name out, but uh, one of these shows that I like to watch from time to time, one of the most horrible characters in the show inherits millions of dollars when his grandmother dies. He's the favorite grandchild of, uh, I I think some of you know the program I might be talking about. Uh, But he's the favorite grandchild, so he gets all the wealth of his grandmother. He inherits it. And so he does what what any uh, eight-year-old kid would do. He gets his wagon, piles all the money in the wagon, and then drags it along behind him and starts mocking his friends about how rich he is now. And finally, one of them gets so frustrated with this display of just pride and arrogance that he tells him to knock it off because you didn't earn that money. And then, incredulous, this little, this little boy says, didn't earn it. Didn't earn it. I can't tell you how many times I've had my cheeks pinched, how many times I've had to put up with old lady smell. Don't you tell me I didn't earn this money. Don't you tell me I didn't earn it. Now, despite what one horrible animated character might believe... No one really earns an inheritance. Again, it's something that's given to you in lieu of a relationship, right? It's, it's, an, imparting of, it's an imparting of wealth based on a relationship primarily. But there's another thing in this passage that should stri- strike us, I think pretty profoundly. It, it, it's something that's almost hidden in the text. Did you notice that the response of the righteous and the unrighteous to the, to, the pro, the, to the proclamation of the king on his throne, what they say in response is basically the same? Did you notice that? Both ask, when did we ever see you in need, Lord? When did we ever do that? Now, I don't think that response should, should really surprise us from the people who didn't do anything, thing, to, the, to the goats of the crowd, right? To those who didn't serve. Because in some ways, it, that, that kind of explains why they didn't act when they saw people in need. But what is the surprise of the passage is really that the righteous also have that question. When did we serve you, Lord? And that should really catch our attention. Because apparently these righteous folks, these people serving They didn't understand it as a reward. They didn't understand what they were doing as as work towards some reward of entrance into a kingdom. And if they had, maybe their response would have been a bit different. If they understood entrance into the kingdom as a reward, I'd imagine they would say, yep, Lord, that's right, punch my ticket, I'm going in. And on their merry way they go. I tried to think of a good analogy for this, and the best that I could come up with is uh, if if you buy a ticket to get into Disney World, You don't act surprised and ask questions when they let you in. 
maybe depending on what you're wearing, they would. But, but, but still, under normal circumstances, if you buy a ticket for something, if you do something, if, you, if you're going into uh, to an event, you don't act surprised when they let you in. But that's not the attitude of the righteous in this passage. They're surprised. They're surprised because they didn't connect what they were doing with any kind of reward. They weren't motivated by the promise of the kingdom. They were motivated by something else, something more powerful than the promise of reward. Now, I think this is actually a really important thing for us to talk about and consider because finding a consistent motivation for doing justice, for doing right in the world, is actually really difficult. To find something that empowers a consistent attitude, a consistent heart that reaches out to people in love, that's really tough. And most of us, we probably fall back on one of two things, maybe a sense of duty. We fall back on a sense of duty where you really should do something because that's what you're supposed to do. That's what's expected of you. And there might be some guilt thrown in with this whole uh, motivation by duty. But the reasoning goes something like this. If you'll allow me to use a, a really local example, um, well, man, I, you know what? I really should help out in the soup kitchen this, this upcoming week. I really should do that. It is, after all, you know, it's a ministry of this church, and I'm a member of this church. I attend, and as a member, I should really be participating in all the ministries of the church, so I, I should help out this week. I, it's, it's my duty as, as a part of this church to help out in the soup kitchen. Well, if duty doesn't motivate you, Maybe something else will. Uh, this is sort of the motivation of, uh, of my generation. I, I was saying at the sun, in the Sunday school uh, class uh, uh, this morning, in fact, that uh, you find this interesting dynamic between generations where older generations point out the flaws and weaknesses of the younger ones and say, oh, we're, we're, we're so immoral and irreverent. And then the younger people you know, point back and say, you made us like this. You know, they blame, blaming each other in a, a circle of blame, right? Uh, well, when I was growing up, uh, my generation has tend to, tended to be called the selfish generation. And, and when, when I was growing up, it was very popular to motivate kids with, uh, with a motivation that was essentially selfish, right? If you, if you do something, um, if you do something you might not want to do now, it could benefit you in the future, right? If you, if you do some work now that you don't like, then maybe later on you'll get some extra benefit from it. So what I'm saying is, you other people made my generation selfish. That's, that, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Well, if we stick with our example of the soup kitchen, this is how this goes. Uh, you might be told, and this is actually true, that if you spend time helping others, it will make you feel good. You will get, you will get sort of a, a volunteering high off of that. You, you, you will get a sense that you've made a tangible dif difference in the life of people. You will feel good about your service. That, that's basically true for most people. But here's the problem. There are all kinds of things out there that can make you feel good about yourself. And some of those things are more enjoyable to do. So if the goal is to feel good about yourself, to feel good in general, why not do everything else? Why not? But even more, uh, even more dangerous from this perspective is, is really the self-centeredness. Because the, this attitude still means that your service, your giving, it's about you. It's not about the people that you serve. It's not about God. It's about you and how it makes you feel. Ultimately, if we're trying to motivate ourselves to do good through duty or self-centeredness, it can't last. That motivation can't last. It's too weak. It's far too weak to be consistent and to motivate us through years and years. Or if we try to stick with it, we run the risk of becoming embittered because we, we think our service is attached to a sense of obligation and we'll come to resent the obligation. Or we'll just lose interest. We'll lose interest and we'll pursue other things that give us more pleasure. We need something else. We need a deeper motivation for our acts of justice and love and compassion. That's something else, is beauty. Beauty. What do I mean by that? Our hearts have to be captured by a profound sense of beauty and then be dedicated to it. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. One of my favorite musical composers is Vivaldi. Okay, I'm, I'm letting, letting, like when I was a kid in high school, I was listening to Vivaldi. It explains a lot about me, I'm sure. 
But Vivaldi was one of my favorite musical composers, and, and like I said, I started listening to him in high school. I just sort of fell in love with, uh, with his work. And, and when I was in college, that love paid off a little bit. I, I had an assignment in class, in one of my classes, to listen to a piece of classical music and then write a brief interpretation of that piece. So unlike my classmates, I had actually listened to some classical music. So that, that kind of got me a step ahead. But you know what? I hated that assignment. Oh, did I hate that assignment. It took me so long, and, I, and, and it's like I really, really felt a lot of anxiety about it. I hated it because it turned the experience of listening to Vivaldi into a work. That's what it did. It made it work. And if you've ever tried to do something that you've had a deep passion for, uh, if you've ever tried to do it as, as work or, or something like that instead of just enjoying it, you know exactly what I'm talking about here turning something that's enjoyable into work. Instead of listening to the music for the joy that it gave me, I was listening to write a paper to get a good grade so that my GPA was high, so that I could get into a good uh, graduate school or seminary, so that I could then get a good job. I turned music into a means instead of enjoying it as an end in and of itself. But when that assignment was over, I could actually listen to Vivaldi again and experience joy and, and, really, and really just listen to it with the spirit in which it was intended. The reason that God can identify with the least and the lowliest is because God became the least in Jesus Christ. That's exactly what he experienced. Jesus was born in a barn. He was placed in a feeding trough. He experienced hunger he experienced homelessness in his wandering ministry. He was the very victim of injustice when he was cruelly put to death for charges that even his judge didn't believe were real. On the cross, Christ was stripped naked and finally cried out, I'm thirsty. He did all of that, endured all of that, so we could become God's adopted children so that we could become true heirs of God and enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, there is a beauty in that sacrificial love, a beauty that will move our hearts to this awestruck wonder if we let it. And that beauty is what can change the motivation of your heart to serve from beauty and not from duty and obligation. We don't work for justice because we have a duty to do so, even though I would say we do. We don't work for justice because a more just world will benefit us in the end, even though it will. We do justice. We care for the least of these, because if that's where our God is, then that's where our hearts will be drawn. Amen. I invite us to stand as we are able and sing our next hymn, hymn number 151 from the blue hymnal, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Please stand.
You may be seated. That was the final be seated note. (laughs) Uh, Let us affirm our faith uh, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, You can find that in the very beginning of the blue hymnal on page 14. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hear the words of the psalmist. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. Mindful of the grace and majesty of our God, we offer all that we have and all that we are in service to his kingdom. But the ushers come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. Lord God, Heavenly King, we offer these our gifts as signs of love, devotion, and praise. Through these, as through our praises, we acknowledge that you are our Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And now is the time when, as a community of faith, we can share our joys and concerns with one another. Um, I meant to say this a little earlier. For some of you, this is uh, the third one of my sermons that you've heard in the last two days. 
and uh, you earn a special star in your crown for uh, for for that. Uh, but we do know that there there are uh, people in our congregation and uh, uh, people connected to our congregation, uh, people sitting in these pews. Uh, we are in mourning. We've had a, a lot of loss lately, and I ask that you continue to pray for those who mourn, and the trust that God will be their comfort, and. Pray also that God will use you to be a comfort to others. Are there other joys or concerns that we'd like to lift up? Anita. Pray for, I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat? Fair judgment. Fair judgment. Okay. Well, we, uh, we praise God that there were, there were no injuries resulting in an accident and, and involving Anita's children, but uh, uh, we also pray, pray for a fair judgment. Oh, down with the posts. I've been extremely blessed this past weekend. As you can see, two of the daughters are here. That's the only two daughters I have. Uh, and one of my sons is here. The other one is in China, but he's safely there and will probably be there for a few months. And <laughs> not far enough into my mouth. Okay. Uh, did you all hear me? I'm glad to have my daughters here. We had a marvelous Thanksgiving, and it was largely because of our church family. You're all so wonderful, and we've had a good time with you all. Thank you. Well. <laughs> another note of, ooh, another note of uh, joy. Um, I, I'd uh, asked for prayers uh, a couple months ago for Harry Snyder, uh, one of Tyler's babysitters who had been paralyzed with uh, Jan Barre syndrome. He still needs a ventilator, uh, but this uh, week he has been able to. Uh, start talking was moved to a, a rehab center near Johnstown where they've been uh, nursing him for the last couple months. We pray for Harry. Are there other joys or concerns? All right, let's go to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Holy and righteous God, there are times when the busyness of our world and even the preoccupation of our minds, well, it distracts us. It keeps us from remembering who you truly are. You are our sovereign Lord and King. You are master and creator of the whole universe but you do not rule as a tyrant. You do not sit, stay separated from us in heavenly realms of undiminished glory and splendor, but you came among us. You lived as one of us. And not just as one of us who has an easy time in life, not just one who was given everything. You came in weakness and lowliness. You came in poverty. In Jesus Christ, your power was displayed not in wealth and strength, but in love and grace. You came in that fashion because that is what your kingdom is all about. May we never fail to recognize you as Lord over our lives. May we never fail to praise you for what you've given us in Jesus Christ. As we live in this world, help us to remember that you reign over all things. Help us to trust in your reign. Trust not just in an intellectual sense, but in a deep and abiding sense. Help us to trust you enough to deliver into your care 
the concerns of our hearts, the things that weigh us down, the things over which we cry. Help us to trust in you to deliver every need perfectly and meet it. And motivate our hearts, God. Motivate us to be your ambassadors of love and grace, not from a sense of duty, not from self-centeredness, but only, only from a motivation of beauty as we remain astounded by the love you lavished us on the cross and in the empty tomb. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite us to stand as we are able and sing our final hymn, hymn number 142, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. As you go forth from this place, first, don't go forth if you're a member of the church. You need to stay here and vote on officers. But after that, and for the rest of you who are going to go forth from this place, it is my hope that you are reminded of the beauty of the love of God for you in Jesus Christ. Let that beauty resonate in your heart, because that beauty will transform your heart. That will motivate you for right service in this world 
toward acts of amazing compassion and love to strive to make justice in the world. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.